as Sam said, my name is Dominique, but everybody calls me Dom, and when people call me Dom, it makes me feel cooler, so just call me Dom. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to start off today. If you've heard me um, speak before, I kind of love starting off with stories, so I'm going to start off with a story. Um, so when I was a kid, out of my brother and I, I was what people would call the good one, right? And so I remember one time I was in middle school and the way that middle school worked for me, I went to a middle school that I wasn't zoned for. So my mom had to drop me off every day at my friend's house really early so she could get to work and then me and my friend would walk to school together. And so this was the time of MySpace. And so I would get to my friend's house really early and we would hop on MySpace. And uh, you know, there's so much drama. I'm a sixth grade middle school girl. And so we're looking through all these pages and she's just like, oh, this girl did this, blah, blah, blah. blah. I don't even know what it was to be honest with you. It's not important. <laughs> um, but we are looking through it and like, my friend is definitely a little edgier than I am. And so she's like cursing and I'm like, you know, that's not really me. But eventually after I'd been there for a while, you know, I said my first curse word. And then I was like, oh, shoot. And I was always, <laughs> I was always the, I've always had a very, very strong conscience. And this is my like pre, like my BC days. I was not a Christian at this point, but either, either way, like I still felt a lot of guilt. And so I got my, I got home that day and I told my parents that I needed to talk to them. And so I went into my, my room that's like purple and pink and yellow and very girly, very different than I am now. And I brought in two chairs from my family room and sat them facing our bed. And I asked them to take a seat. And I told them, I said, Mom and Dad, I have something to tell you. And they're like freaking out. They're like, what did she do? And I'm just like, so today before school when I was at Samantha's house, I cursed. And I'm crying at this point. I'm like sobbing. And they're just kind of like looking at me like, okay. And so I'm just like, I'm so sorry. And they're just like, you know, Dominique, it's okay. Uh, you made a mistake and you seem torn up about it. So, you know, try not to do it again. But at the end of the day, this isn't the worst thing. And I was like, dude, what? Like they did it. I didn't get like my phone taken away, I didn't get, I didn't get like nothing. My parents are just like, we see that this has affected you greatly by your weeping and sobbing. Um, so you're good. And so I know this is a very small and silly example, but I'm sure you guys can think of times where you should have been punished or um, gotten some kind of consequence for your action and you didn't. And that's grace. Um, and today, our passage is all about grace. Um, and the big idea that we're kind of going to focus on is, like, God's response to man's failure is always grace. Um, so today, we're going to be in Luke chapter 15, if you guys want to look with me. Um, we're going to be reading a very familiar passage, um, the, the parable of the prodigal son. Um, we're going to start in verse 11, and we're going to go all the way down to the end. So I'm just going to read that real quick and pray, and we can dive in. Okay, so in verse 11, Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided the property between them. Not long after that, the youngest son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth and wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. 
But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to a servant, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad, because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Would you guys pray with me? Uh, Father God, so grateful for this word that you have given us. Um, thank you for your spirit that um, allows us to read and to understand, God. And I just pray as we dive deeper into this passage that my words would be your words. Your words would be mine, God, that I'm um, only speaking what you have given me. And I just pray for everybody in this room that this, um, the word, the scripture would touch their hearts in the way that you see fit. And it's in your beautiful name that we pray, God. Amen. Okay, so uh, it's probably likely that some of you guys have heard this parable before. Um, and so I'm going to look at it a little differently um, than, I guess, when I first approached it. I was, but anyways, we're going to look at uh, the difference between man and the difference between God in this passage. Because this shows some really cool contrasts and juxtapositions that um, I was able to um, see when I was reading it. And so we're going to kind of look at three different uh, areas that are contrasted. The first is going to be perspective, the way that man's perspective differs from God. The second will be our motives, our motivations, how our motivations different from, differ from God's. And lastly will be our actions. So for our first point, um, dealing with perspective. We see in this passage, man is nearsighted, and God, his perspective is eternal. And so what I mean by nearsighted, so I am very blind without my glasses or contacts. And so I am actually, I have nearsighted vision. So that means that without my glasses, anything that's not, that's further than a foot away from me is questionable. Um, if I was up here preaching and I did not have context on, I would not be able to see any of your faces. And so basically this nearsighted definition is like in my own power, without the aid of my glasses, I cannot see further than a few feet in front of me. Um, and so when I say that man's vision is nearsighted, I mean the same thing. In our own power, without the help of God, it's really hard to have um, an eternal perspective. But let's look first at the two sons and see how their perspective um, is nearsighted. Um, so let's look at the youngest son first. So in the son's departure, he was very, uh, very nearsighted in the way that he was just focused on how he was feeling here and now. He had probably lived um, on his father's land and worked the land for his entire life and he was bored with this simple life, and he was like, you know what? I am ready to turn up. And so he's like, I want something different right now, and I'm not getting it from here, and um, I'm not going to think about what this could lead to in the future. I'm just going to focus on the here and now. Um, and so 
that focus that's not looking for it at all um, led him to make this choice that was not a great choice in the beginning. Um, and also, we can see his nearsighted reaction even, on, even upon his return. Because when uh, it tells us what he's thinking about telling his father, um, he's focused on the immediate reaction of his dad. Um, he's focused on his survival. He's like, how am I going to live <laughs> to see tomorrow? I'm starving right now, and I need to be able to survive. And so even upon his return, he still has a little bit of that nearsighted vision. Um, and then when we look at our, our eldest son, he has something that is not a word, but I made it a word, um, we call past sightedness. Um, and he, when we see him at the, in the latter half of the parable, we see that he is focused on all the things that the younger, Sid did, younger son did wrong. He's like, but he did all of these things. He was chilling with prostitutes. Like, he, he's so focused on what happened in the past that he can't see the miracle and the amazing thing that it is that this, this brother of his, this father's son, has returned. Um, and nearsightedness for us as believers is one of the easiest and most dangerous traps for us to fall into. Um, and just think about it. What happens when we shift our perspective from a nearsighted one to one that is eternal? So suddenly you realize that all the time and energy that you spent feuding with that person, not liking that person, sending like rude things over social media to that person, all that time was wasted. Um, you can't take that feud into eternity if you're planning on spending it with God. And suddenly, that guy who cut you off on the highway and then proceeded to go 20 miles below the speed limit is not a jerk, but he is an eternal soul that will either be chilling with you in heaven or destined to an eternity separate from God. What happens when we make that shift? This eternal perspective is completely demonstrated by the father in this story. Um, so when the youngest son returns, the father sees restoration. He doesn't see, um, he doesn't have past sightedness. He's not focused on the actions of his, of his son uh, previously. Um, he sees a restored relationship. And if we substitute the father in the story as God and um, how he deals with us, God sees, when we mess up, he sees repentance and a restored relationship if we do repent. He's not harping on your sin. He's not um, focused on how we hurt him. His, his focus is on the restored relationship. And so I encourage you guys, look at your lives. When you look at how you're living, what is your vision like? How is your perspective? Are you dealing with some nearsighted itis or past sighted itis? Or are you actually clinging to what matters when you're dealing with people that are hard and that are difficult? Are you, are you clinging to what matters in that? So first point is about our perspective. Man is nearsighted. God's perspective is eternal. Um, the second point, we're going to talk about motivations. So in this passage, it's really easy to see how man is self-serving and God is selfless. Um, so motives are tricky because we can do lots of good things with terrible motives. For example, uh, when I was a kid, um, I, I'm, I'm an older sister. And so my younger brother, we, we didn't get along that much. And so when I was nice to him, it was very noticeable. <laughs> and so, um, for example, I would do lots of like seemingly nice things with real, real shady like motives. And so, for example, um, if we were in line for like food or something, and I was in front of my brother, and I could like count the number of people and then count the plates that were there. And I'm like, mm, the plate that I'm going to get is like smaller than the plate that he's going to get. So in my kindness, I let my brother get in front of me because I'm like, hey, bro, you know, I love you. And you deserve to go first. I did not care about him going first. I just wanted the bigger plate of food. <laughs> and, so, and so 
and I, I say that and it's like funny, but it's also like, geez, Dom, you are so selfish. And I like, that's still some, I'm not gonna lie to you guys, it's still something that I struggle with. Like, um, it's something that it's just natural for humanity. That's something that we, um, we struggle with. And so um, this is also something that the brothers struggled with. So we see, um, looking again at the youngest son, um, so when we talk about inheritance in this culture, it works in a lot of the same ways that ours does. When someone dies, their material possessions are passed off to um, either next of kin or if they have a will, whoever they've specified in that will. Um, but in this culture, family had an enormous meaning uh, and value. And so you... You did not get it and give, no, no parent is giving their son an inheritance just because they ask for it. In fact, for the youngest son to even ask God, I mean not God, uh, Father, give me my inheritance is the equivalent of him wishing him dead. And so that is incredibly selfish and disrespectful. And it's ironic too because in, with the youngest son wishing that his father would metaphorically die so that he could get his inheritance, it actually revealed that youngest son's own spiritual death. Um, so we have an incredible amount of selfishness that is, is there, and even more so than we might interpret it as today because um, we just don't have the same cultural uh, stipulations. And we also see extreme selfishness in our eldest son. Um, he refuses to celebrate with the youngest brother and with the father and with the rest of the household um, because his desire at the end of the day is for his own glorification. Um, when I read this passage, and maybe, maybe it is like this, maybe it's not, but I have like visuals going on in my head, and so I just imagine like the older brother kind of like pouting, and I'm just like, dude, you're like a whole adult, like why are you pouting? But um, he, he feels self-righteous. And I'm not going to lie, if I was in his shoes, I don't know that I wouldn't feel the same way. Like if I've been laboring and like doing what I think is good work, and somewhere along the way, I was doing that um, so that I could be recognized. If I don't get recognized, I'm going to have my feelings hurt. And so it's understandable. Um, and it's, it's also sad because when he's talking to his father, he tells, he tells him that this son of yours. So that language, this son of yours, he's taking um, that relationship and like cutting it off from himself. He's like saying, it doesn't belong to me, not my family, this son of yours that you've claimed, that you've reclaimed. Um, and it's even a little bit mocking of what the father says in um, verse 24, because he says, this son of mine was dead and is alive again, he was lost and is found. But what's crazy is that when the father responds to him, in verse uh, 22, we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours. And so God, God is, even, even in these words, like we're seeing his focus on relationship being restored. Even if you don't want it to be restored, if it should be restored, God is in the business of doing that. Um, and... This eldest son's just disrespect almost of his father um, in demanding his own glorification, his own party with his friends. Um, it's ironic, too, because this disrespect of his father goes against his argument that he's honored his father so well. Um, and if you put yourself in the father's shoes, this has to be heartbreaking for him. Uh, he goes from tragically losing one son, um, wishing who wished him death, um, to getting him back miraculously, rejoicing, and then slowly losing the other one. Um, but we don't see him holding that hurt against um, his sons because the father in this story, as well as God, they're selfless. Um, First, first of all, he gives the youngest son his inheritance. Like I said, this, uh, the cultural implications of this is, are huge. Um, he could have easily, 
after he made that request, been like, no, you're not getting this inheritance, and you're banished from the family. He could have, like, excommunicated him from the family, so to speak, um, but he doesn't. He gives him the inheritance, and this shows his selflessness because this father was so tuned in to his children, so tuned in to his youngest son that he knew that giving him his inheritance and allowing him to leave would hopefully prevent him from going even further than if he refused. Um, and that's, that's that eternal perspective, right? We're looking at what will my actions, what will the consequences of my actions be years, years from now and into eternity? Um, and the younger son, when he returns with his tail between his legs, um, the father's focus is not on himself. Uh, the text says that he was filled with compassion. And that is, that is a huge thing. If you have been uh, tragically and painfully separated from your child because of their own doing for years, um, to be immediately filled with compassion is a supernatural thing. Like, that doesn't, that's not normal. That's not natural for us. Um, he ran to his son and he kissed him. He kissed his son and then he threw him a party. Little did the younger son know that if he would have just stayed, he could have had his own turn up at the house. But he didn't do that. Um, and so at the end of the day, we see that selfishness honestly doesn't benefit anybody. It didn't benefit either the sons nor the father. But the selflessness showed by the father benefited everyone. And uh, the third point is talking about actions. And so this is a hard one for me because I, yeah, this is, this is just hard because I am, I see so much of myself in the older and younger brothers in this point. So man is very much works focused. We're focused on the things that we do while God is grace focused. Um, so when I say works focused, I mean somebody who believes that by doing enough good things uh, all the time for, the, for whoever it is, whether it be God or whatever, you can kind of earn your way, in a Christian sense, into salvation. You can earn God's grace, you can earn his love, his favor, all these things. And so Bible study turns into not a joyous thing where we can learn about God and uh, just increase that relationship, it turns into something that's on a checklist that I have to do to make sure that um, I'm going to get into heaven at the end of the day. Um, and so the youngest son <laughs> is, is really works focused in his speech. And I think, it's, I think it's, you know, like an innocent thing. I don't think that he's like malicious in it, but I imagine him like in the pig pen, kind of like pacing back and forth and like thinking about this speech that he's going to give it to his father. And he's going to be like, okay, okay. So <sighs> this is going to be really hard and really embarrassing but I've got to go back to my dad, and I just, like, I know I've hurt him so bad, and so I've got to, like, tell him all the things that I've done, and, like, you know what? I won't even say that I'm his son anymore. Like, it's just, we're, we're just gonna, I can just serve you, and these are all the ways that I'm going to make up for what I did. So in the preparation of his speech, the youngest son is focused on what he did and what he's going to do to make it better. That is his focus. That is his motivation. Um, and then the eldest son, in much the same way, but in an even more dangerous and malicious way, is focused on works. Um, he's focused on all of the things that he did for the father um, over the years. He said, uh, he said, look, in verse uh, 29, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. I did all of these things right, Dad. I did all of these things right for you. But you didn't even give me like a small little calf or goat um, that I could use to have a party with my friends. Um, and the malicious part about it is that he doesn't even stop there. He doesn't even stop at talking about the things that he did. He talks about the things that the brother did. He starts pointing out all of the things that the youngest brother did um, to disappoint their family. He feels slighted 
and he feels like he's not getting what he deserved because he has a list of all of the things that he's done and compares that list to all the things that the brother has done. They have a good column and a bad column. And he, if you look at the list, he wins. But that's not what the father is focused on. And I don't know about you guys, but when I look at my own life, I can definitely, I have the tendency to be very, very works focused. Um, and that's dangerous. It's dangerous um, for my own faith and for leading others in their faith because it's not about what we do, it's about what God has done. Um, so, what is the Father's response to this works focused mentality? It's a grace focused one. When the Father interacts with the younger son, when he comes back, he doesn't even mention what happened. He doesn't even mention the years of hurt and pain that he must have experienced, all the, the nights he spent on his knees praying for his son's safe return, the tears that he shed, he doesn't even mention it. When the son says that he isn't worthy to be called his son, the father reaffirms his sonship. He reaffirms his relationship to him. Um, of course, the youngest son wouldn't come back and be a servant. Um, the father isn't petty and being like, oh, well, you remember when you basically wished me dead? <laughs> You're going to have to work for that, buddy. Like, he doesn't say that. He, he's focused on the relationship that has been restored because that's what he cares about. He's, he's, he's selfless in sacrificing his own feelings and his own revenge that he could get, so to speak. Um, and he's focused entirely on what this means for his relationship. And family, God is focused on our salvation. Um, when we sin, he's not sitting there hung up on it. He's not berating you for it. Um, as long as you own up to it and you're working to not do it again, that's what God cares about. Because that's how we build our relationship with him. And I speak from experience when I say, just because you've been a Christian longer doesn't mean that you're like less likely to mess up. Uh, the mess ups will come out of nowhere sometimes, and sometimes they'll be a slow, gradual process. Um, and what matters is our reaction to them. Um, and when we look at the father's interactions with his eldest son, we, we can, I mean, maybe you guys don't, I think that the son is being a little bratty, um, but just as the father doesn't bring up the failures of the younger son, he also doesn't bring up the successes of the eldest one. He doesn't, he doesn't even mention all the things that the, the eldest son does right. Instead, what he says is, you are always with me. He reaffirms that relationship. So whether you identify with the youngest son or the eldest son, God's relationship with you, it doesn't, it doesn't matter he, he wants a relationship with you regardless of where you lean on the sin scale, whether it be more prideful or it be more just rebellious, you know? Um, does this mean that God doesn't recognize our works um, that we do for his honor and for his glory? No. The Bible is very clear about um, our reward in heaven. And we should all kind of be striving towards, you know, when that day comes to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. Um, but it does mean that God won't allow us to elevate ourselves, you to use our works to elevate ourselves, and not only to seek glory from other people, but to seek glory from God, to say, God, you should be honoring me. We got to check our hearts if that's where we're at. Um, so, this is what God cares about. Like I said, he cares that we're in a relationship with him. He doesn't care uh, if you have started the biggest Christian nonprofit, uh, multi-million dollar nonprofit, um, unless it's for his glory. Because at the end of the day, there are lots of organizations and ministries out there. And 
uh, each one will be evaluated by God based on their adherence to uh, his grace and his love. Are we doing this for our own glory um, or for his? And so that was the part when I was writing my sermon. I was like, geez, man kind of like stinks. <laughs> um, and so I was just like, okay, so what is the, what is the connecting piece? How do we get to become a grace-focused being who is selfless and sees with an eternal perspective, puts on the, the holy glasses, right? Um, so the first step is you have to know God. You have to become a believer. If um, We can't do this in our own power. This isn't something that you can just kind of like power through. And Because if you are doing that, then you're having a work-focused mentality. Um, so it's a vicious cycle. So if you haven't met God, he's, he's waiting for you. He's sitting there, and he's not going to shun you. You might think that you've done things that can't be forgiven, and fortunately, that's not true. He's waiting there to hug you and to kiss you and to rejoice with you um, over the relationship because that's what matters. And second, if you are a believer then we have to treat it like a relationship. Um, I can't imagine having become best friends with some of the people that I'm best friends with without spending time with them and getting to know them. And so, um, and this is and this is tricky too because we don't want to be works focused, but it's it's natural. Like if you have somebody that you really enjoy spending time with and you want to get to know better, you do that. You put in the time. You talk to them on the phone. You do fun things with them. Um, and we have been fortunate enough to have, like, and we ha always have access to God. We don't have to, like, schedule, like, okay, well, two weeks, uh, two weeks from now at 4 p.m., maybe 4 to 5, because my schedule's kind of tight. Let's, let's get dinner. You know, we don't have to do that. We have to do that with our people here sometimes because, like, schedules get crazy. But we always have an open line of communication with God through prayer. How, how, how can you deem that you know somebody that you never spend time with? Um, and his word, ah, his word is an amazing way through which to get to know God. Um, and he wants, he, wants to, he wants you to know him more um, so that you feel that connection, you feel that safety. Um, and third, another thing that I was thinking that can help bridge that gap is just avoiding compromise. Um, when I read this story, I always wonder how the youngest son got to the place that he was when he left. Um, was it that he just was never really bought into it and he, was at, he just reached his breaking point? He was like, I must leave. I must go to another land. Um, or was he maybe kind of bought into it when he was a kid, but slowly along the way he started making compromises and hanging out with the wrong people and just kind of getting deeper and deeper with little things that don't seem like much at all but eventually was his heart hardened enough that he was he was willing to leave i don't know <laughs> um, it is a parable so uh who knows if this is actually like a true story but um either way um, it's really easy to do that. And when you become a Christian, it's easy to like have those compromises. So, ooh, maybe I will look for a little longer at that brother or sister that's really attractive. And ooh, maybe I will start looking at inappropriate images online. It's no big deal. Like, I'm not doing anything with anybody. And then, ooh, maybe this website is the website that I'm going to spend all my time on. And then, ooh, this chat room. It just spirals and spirals and spirals. Um, and so an easy way to avoid that is to be in community with people who love you and who will call you out and who will pray with you and walk with you through your struggles. Like, like this parable, God isn't focused on the ways that we messed up. He's focused on a relationship. And so to have people around you that can pour into that. And um, if, you're, if, you're, if you're a Christian at all, um, you should have somebody that's, 
a little bit further along on the journey than you, pouring into you. And then God has given you all of these gifts and this love. He doesn't just give you this relationship for you to just sit there and be like, ah, God, cool, which is really a cool part of the relationship. Don't get me wrong, but we're supposed to be using our gifts and loving those people well. Um, maybe you know somebody who's going through something really hard. How are you speaking into them as a believer? Um, so these are not all the steps by any means. There are several ways that we can uh, get closer to an eternal perspective, a selfless motivation, and uh, a grace-focused action mentality. Um, but I just encourage you guys to think. Um, so as we kind of come to conclusion, I just want to uh, wrap up and say, and just kind of like go back over it. So, man, nearsighted, selfish, and works focused. Um, these are just our natural tendencies. Um, but things really do begin to change when we encounter a good, good father. You don't come face to face with and interact with that kind of grace, and it doesn't change you in some way. And so praise God for that. Praise God for that. Um, and secondly, we have a God who looks at us as eternal beings. He doesn't just see you where you're at right now. He doesn't just see the job that you're struggling in um, or the sin that you're committing right now. He sees into eternity. Um, and he wants that relationship with you. We have a God who is selfless, who's going to put um, our relationship with him above his own the ways that we have hurt him. He's not going to hold on to that if we ask for forgiveness and repent. And we have a grace-giving God. Um, we don't have a God that berates us when we make mistakes. We have a God that loves us without boundaries. Um, so in a couple of minutes, we're actually going to do communion. If you've been at Loft before, we're going to do it a little differently. Um, instead of the team just coming in and playing like a song. So for me, when I'm sitting in communion and I hear a really good message, and then we have like a song that comes on that's like such a good song, it is so hard for me to actually sit there and think about the, the, um, the ways that God is speaking to me. So we're going to give you guys just a little time to think and pray. Um, the point of communion is a remembrance of um, God's grace. Uh, the grace that he gave us in sacrificing his son on the cross. Um, with the juice that represents his blood and the crackers, the, the, yes, the crackers that represent his body. I'm not sure what they're called. <laughs> um, and so as you're sitting there and you're thinking, uh, how, how can I... Uh, how is God calling me to confess? What are the things in my life that are blocking me from prioritizing that relationship with God? And what are the things that might cause me to stray away or to build up pride in my heart? Um, so yeah, um, I'm just going to pray for us real quick, and then they'll strum for a couple of seconds, and you guys can have a reflection time. I love reflection times. Um, and then you guys can come up. The way that we do it is we all just come through this middle Message, grab your juice, grab your cracker, and uh, you can go back and take communion at your seat. Uh, thank you, guys. If you will pray with me. Uh, Father God, um, I'm so thankful to you, Jesus, for um, your grace and the way that you view me and the rest of my brothers and sisters in here, God. Um, I'm so thankful for the way that you love um, and the example that you are for us in loving in the midst of hurt, in the midst of pain. And I know that's so difficult to do, God, and I just ask for your strength to be able to do that well. Um, God, I thank you for the ultimate sacrifice that you, that you did for us the sacrificing your son on the cross, God, um, in ways that we can't even imagine you were hurt and you were in pain, but you loved us through the hurt, God. And I just pray that as we go forth through this week, the 
rest of this day, God. Um, your spirit would guide us. You would show us the ways that we can uh, restore our relationship in some cases, um, to start a relationship, Lord, or to just get closer to you, God, because that's what we want. We want your love, and we want to show it to others. So it's in your name that we pray, and I thank you, God. Amen.